We're very excited and honored this morning to welcome the Giving Spirit to our school. And I want to thank all of you for being open to learning about the Giving Spirit, especially the Companion Animals Project. I think you're going to find today very eye-opening, heart-opening, and mind-opening. I'm going to hand the mic over to our moderator, um, Stacy Cruz, but I just wanted to let you know we have Audra, and this is Bentley. Bentley. Hi, Bentley. <laughs> and we have Heather from the Michelson Foundation, and our other panelist is Jose, and this is Mary. Mary's sleeping, so <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and being in your seats and listening. We are really happy to be here today. And so in discussion with Ms. Nora and with others, we thought, you know what? It would make a lot of sense. The timing would, would be good to talk about animals that are experiencing homelessness and people and animals that are experiencing it together around blessing of the animals, around this season. And so that's why we're here. We move forward and we show our faith and we become good community members when we use our, our heads, our hearts, and our hands. That's exactly what we're doing today. We're using our heads to learn facts. We're using our hearts to really internalize that information and hear other people's stories and perspectives. And then hopefully that gives us a chance to think about, okay, how could we use our hands? When we walk out of school today, when we walk out of this assembly, what are ways that we can put that into action to both show our faith and be really engaged in our community around these topics. So that's why we're here. So if you walk out just thinking, head, heart, hands, what did I learn, how did I feel, what stories did I hear, and how can I put that into action? That is a really good use of a Thursday morning. How many people do you think are living homeless in the greater Los Angeles area? 70,000 is the number. And it's really important to know that just because you don't see someone in a tent on the street, there's a lot of different ways that people experience homelessness. They might be staying with a family member or a friend, but it's not permanent housing. They might be staying in a vehicle or in a camper. So the people that we actually see sometimes is the smallest percentage of people in our community that may be experiencing housing instability or homelessness. So 70,000, that, that was the actual number. It's probably higher than that. That's what we think that it is. Because um, it's hard to count people that you don't see you know, as they're going about their lives. How many people do you think are experiencing homelessness with their animals in Los Angeles? It's around 10%. Around 10% we think of people that are experiencing homelessness are experiencing that with a companion animal, usually a cat or dog. So it's around 75, maybe 8,000 maybe 8, people that are out there experiencing that with an animal family member. And two of our panelists are gonna, they're gonna share their stories today. Do you think that there is enough housing in Los Angeles for people that are experiencing homelessness? As, as much as we try, and as many resources are going into homeless services, right now, there, there isn't enough housing. There aren't enough beds for people that are experiencing homelessness. And we just all need to be really aware of that. Um, and know that when we see people that are experiencing homelessness, it, you know, it's not because there's a bed or a house waiting for them, and they're turning it down. There, there may just not be enough. And our panelists can help us understand that as well. So we're gonna to get to know our panelists. And so we, we really wanted to start out with that, the head part. Let's think about what the numbers are, because once we know what the facts are, then we can better understand people's stories and figure out if we can have a role in helping address some of those challenges that our neighbors are experiencing, our animal neighbors and our human neighbors. Now we're gonna show you a video so you get a chance to get to know our animal friends outside of their crates. And the reason that they're in their crates is not in any way because they're dangerous, but because we wanna keep them safe and we want to keep everybody safe. They are both certified service animals, and they are very friendly, but this is a new environment. New people, lots of new faces, lots of new smells, and we want them to be as safe and calm as possible. So that's why they are happy in their crates. Don't worry that they are in some way unfriendly. They're probably too friendly. <laughs> um, but we want to make sure that everyone is, is really protected and stress-free today, but we did uh, to create a video so that you could get to know them a little bit outside of their crate. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to play that video for you and then we'll talk to our panelists. Hello everyone, uh, this is Mary uh, Garcia because I'm, you know, I'm a Garcia and she is an eight-year-old chow chow mix. Now I don't know what she's mixed with but um, 
She does have a purple tongue, which is a trait only Chow Chows have. And she's a elderly dog. After six years old, they're considered elderly. Yeah, she's my best friend. I, I wouldn't know where I'd be without her. Hi, I'm Audra Renee Houston, and this is my dog, Bentley Emmanuel. I got Bentley two years ago. He's been such a force in my life. He's been such a calm force. When I'm raging inside, he'll actually hug me, he'll watch me, he'll be close to me. And uh, he has been a saving grace. If my day is not full, we're here 90% of the time, literally at this beach. So this is like our second home. He is part of all of that, that makes me whole. So I'm grateful. You knew what to do, huh? Jose, can you introduce yourself and Mary and tell us a little bit about, about your story? Sure thing. Um, good morning, everybody. I'll try to keep this upbeat because I know you guys are probably sleepy. I know I am before this coffee. <laughs> uh, I am Jose Garcia. Uh, this is Mary Garcia. And I, huh, I joined, yeah, where to start? I joined the Marines straight out of high school. Um, and uh, I got deployed you know, overseas. And uh, when I got back, I got back injured. So it was, uh, it was hard finding a, something to do. I, I figured I would uh, be a Marine for the rest of my life and retire, but life, you know, God has different plans for different people sometimes. And um, I ended up uh, homeless because of a relationship that failed. Sometimes, Homelessness isn't because of that person having mental health issues or because they made bad decisions or because they deserve it or because they want to be homeless. Sometimes it just happens. Coming back, I had a post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. I'm sure you guys have all heard about that. I uh, felt like less of a person, uh, depression um, in the thoughts that I was a loser, you know, that no one loved me, I failed, um, failure at, you know, being a man even, providing for my family. I didn't realize that I needed a dog. Um, I always had one, but you know, I just, I didn't, I didn't realize till that moment. So I went looking, and um, three shelters. <laughs> In one day, uh, I, I was staying at, at uh, Northridge at the time, so um, the North Valley one is where I met Mary, um, and it was love at first sight, you know? <laughs> you saw how cute she was. I couldn't believe she was at a shelter. Having that dog, like you said, giving a shit about me, um, changed everything. Um, in my lowest point, I contemplated suicide a few times, which is um, very grateful that the VA had a program where I could both stay at while I finished my bachelor's, saved up my money, and have Mary there. Uh, but the mental health services were a really big part on, you know, help me out. So Audra, can you tell us about, a little bit about your background? You know, where are you from? What is, what is your profession? And how did you and how did you and Bentley find each other? Thank you. Thank you, Miss Stacy. Hello. How are you all? I, I'm I'm glad to hear that. I'm I'm an educator by trade. Uh, I work as a reading coach, a substitute teacher, prayer professional, uh, a workshop presenter for uh, adults as well. And my background and my life has been a roller coaster. And I say that in a good way because people like roller coasters, but they're scary. It's, it's fearful for some. Being in my car and how I became homeless uh, was around 2019, 2020. Many variables, just like Murphy's Law, one thing happened and then there's like a snowball. So I had some issues with my great aunt who was my uh, landlord. And then I also was working as her uh, activities director, caregiver, and I was also substitute teaching. 
I had some mental health issues. It runs in my family that also played a part, played a part in my uh, homelessness. And I had been not in therapy. So therapy and all those things that help a person to be whole spiritually, emotionally, I did. How I met Bentley was uh, in 2021. Uh, I was going to uh, the shelter to get another service animal. I had one prior to and uh, it ran away. And uh, I, I felt like I needed that for my mental health and my physical health. I fell in love with Bentley. This was in 2021, so almost two years come next month. Two and a half years after my birthday. So I felt like the Lord had given me this beautiful dog. And let's just say it was instant I love yous. I, it, was, it was that reciprocity. And I've been with him and he's been with me for all this time. And I'm so grateful because I believe that animals, people, housing, job, all those things play a factor in your mental health and this has helped me. Okay, Heather, can you tell us about you and what you do? And Heather is one of our friends at the Michelson Animal Foundation. So we really wanna know what the foundation does too. Sure, absolutely. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Maybe can you pass that one down? Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Heather and I work for an organization called Michelson Found Animals. And um, I also have, you know, experienced tough times in my life and I moved to Los Angeles from Cleveland, Ohio and um, really just wanted to do something that helped this community. It really struck me how much beauty there is in Los Angeles, but also how much need. And so I decided to work for Michelson Found Animals, and we are an animal welfare nonprofit here in Los Angeles. And we like to say that we try to help on both ends of the leash. So um, you might think about a shelter system or animals or the strays that Stacy was talking about, you know, those animals need help, but without helping the people behind the animals, then we can't help the animals. So our organization has a few different programs that help people and pets. So whether it's hosting um, events that offer free, free pet food, free services, or we have an initiative where we're trying to make housing more pet friendly. Um, a lot of people do wind up homeless because a lot of apartments in Los Angeles specifically have breed restrictions, meaning if you have a pit bull, it's a no. If your dog is over 60 pounds, it's a no. You know, there's a lot of different um, restrictions that limit people from being able to rent in Los Angeles, and people will choose their pets over housing, which really says a lot about how important pets are to people and, you know, the sacrifices that they'll make to make sure that they have their pet and that their pet is healthy and happy, and they will, you know, choose to stay with their pet in their car versus. Um, you know, living in an apartment without their pet. So we have an initiative that focuses on that. And then the initiative that I work for um, helps people to work with animals who see animal care as, you know, a future career for them or something that they would like to get involved with. And it's really important to me, especially to see all your young faces, to talk about this, this topic and talk about animals and working with animals because um, a lot of you are probably love animals, and that is something that is a passion of yours. But a lot of young people don't really realize where they can take that passion. They might think a veterinarian is the only, only option, but there are many options, and there are many ways that you can help animals and help people in the process without necessarily being a veterinarian. Thank you all for describing um, your experiences. There's a couple of threads there we want to pull on a little bit to learn a little bit more information. So one of the things that Heather mentioned was this idea that they're pet inclusive housing, that it can be really difficult to find housing that allows you to have a pet. And you would think for people that have a service animal, and I'm sure a lot of us may have family members that have service animals as well, you're supposed to be able to bring them everywhere. So in your mind, that may be kind of a disconnect. Well, like, wait a minute, I understand that there might not be enough housing for everybody, but certainly if you find housing and you have a service animal, then it shouldn't be a problem, right? But that's not the case. And I know that that's something, Audra, that you and Jose both experienced. So can you tell us a little bit about that, about your experience in trying to find housing? Because I know for you and Bentley, it's been a couple of years now that you've been waiting to find someplace. 
What has that experience been for you? Thank you. My experience with that has been where the powers that be, uh, typically, if you are in my position, you don't have power or money to fight or go to court and get a lawyer. Um, you are supposed to be able to bring your support and service animal. Some people make the animal support and a therapy and a service. So it depends on what that dog can do for you. If it's under the ADA, if it's protected, if it's protected by um, the labor laws and housing laws. And yes, people will discriminate, uh, even with a service support or therapy animal. And you may have bona fide documentation, uh, but they know that you're not gonna go to court and try to sue them when you're actually trying to get housed and other things, other variables are going on in your life. I had an apartment, I had, I thought, it right in my hand. And this is recent, we're gonna say as recent as six, seven months ago, we went through the rigmarole of a voucher. I don't know if you guys know about vouchers, but sometimes there's vouchers that they have for housing and they call it Section 8. It's a government funded program to get you on your feet. And you know, the paperwork that takes place with the landlord and the landlord even wanted to charge me a pet fee and that's illegal. If you have a service or support animal for housing and jobs and people take the, the, the animal to the job place depending, um, she said that she was not gonna discriminate and that she even told me that she had family in her background that also had mental health conditions as well. So we hit it off, I thought. But at the total end, after everything was taken care of, the finances through an agency that I was working with, because sometimes you need extra money and help beyond yourself, um, everything's ready to go. And then they said, you know what, we're pulling out. Uh, we don't want to rent to you. If the government is putting money into housing and into services for people that are homeless, then why doesn't everybody have a place to live? Well, for one, there's not enough housing. And then sometimes it's not always easy. Sometimes you can think that you have housing, but especially if you've got an animal, even if it's a service animal, um, not, not all people are always really kind and ethical when it comes to helping people get into housing. Some of it's by choice. You know, there's a lot of people in shelter, different spirits, different personalities. A lot of times it's overcrowded. There's a lot of different uh, things that I decided where I'm in like a safe parking uh, place for people that have cars. And you have porta potty, you have a wash uh, bin, and sometimes a refrigerator, if not an outlet for your devices and a microwave. So I chose that route as I'm believing and hoping and doing my part to change the ties from homelessness to stable housing, permanent housing. I try to get an apartment, you know? Uh, it's you know, kind of tacky to talk about how much money you make, but. Uh, I have a pension. I, I make $4,000 a month for uh, my service. And you would imagine with that much money, you could get a, a room for rent at least, if not an apartment. <sighs> but you can't. They don't want to rent a room to a guy and a big dog. They only want to rent apartments. And I couldn't do that and help my family out at the time, so I had to go into that uh, homeless program. It's, uh, it's, a, it's illegal um, for them to discriminate, but I figured that if I lied and didn't mention Mary, that eventually that would also not be right. I was stuck between a, a rock and a hard place, lying to these landlords to get myself and Mary housed or checking myself into a homeless program. What has the animal, having an animal companion meant for you as you've navigated your own struggles and stress? It was an adjustment, an adjustment that was worth being made. In my family, uh, there's the whole gamut of uh, mental health, health issues. Uh, schizophrenia, my grandmother, maternal uh, grandmother, as well as my mother, are considered schizophrenic. Uh, then there's depression, he mentioned PTSD. Uh, anxiety is, is, and then of course you have cognitive developmental uh, issues as well. So it's a, it's an umbrella. Mine is emotional, and so he helps to regulate uh, my uh, 
my anxiety that I have. With the dog, you realize that uh, you have a little being that's depending on you wholeheartedly. They know no one else most of the time. You know, they meet people as they go, they meet dogs as they go, but they're like a baby. You know, they, they're they smart, you know, but it's, they can't care for themselves and their hygiene properly and their teeth and their food um, the way that a human being could do for them. So it's just a reciprocity. Uh, being mindful of my support and service animal, which he has, he functions as both for me. And I'm considering making him a therapy dog. But, you know, when you are in that predicament, and it's just, I believe for many people, it is uh, just a chapter in their lives where the home, I just believe that people will be housed and people will be cared for. When you're in that situation, it's just to have the idea that it's temporary, that you can go back to work and that there will be some place where you can uh, take care of the dog and it will be, uh, advantageous, you know, for you. It just, it's your outlook and your attitude. I uh, have to take care of her. <laughs> uh, it, it is a responsibility that I have to get up in the morning to walk her, to poop and pee. <laughs> Got to feed her, make sure her water bowl is full. And it helps me be responsible. Um, I didn't realize this until I mentioned that my ex took my dog and I went about a month and a half without a dog. And I started to get lazy. And I started to get distracted with life and just stay on the couch. And I realized dogs and pets in general, uh, for me personally, uh, is responsibility. Um, unconditional love, that's really hard to find. Sometimes parents don't give it to you the way they're supposed to. A lot of people are antisocial and don't have friends, like a lot of us do. You know, fortunate that we are. And pets, pets do that for us. People talk about the bond of, of dog and man, how dog is man's best friend. Um, I don't think it's talked enough about the bond that man has towards a dog. It's something that you hold, I hold sacred, and I'm sure a lot of owners hold that bond sacred. Similar to parenting or to having kids, there's no one rule book to having a pet. You know, there is no one right way to be a good pet parent. But if you love them, that goes such a long way. And if you show that love to them, that really has a positive effect. So even if you might be going through struggles or you um, are struggling with mental health, that doesn't mean you can't be a good pet parent as long as that, that person is able to be responsible and take care of them. But if they don't have a hundred toys, that doesn't mean you're a bad pet parent. There are a lot of organizations in town, and the Michelson Found Animal Foundation is one of them, that provides low-cost grooming services, that provides veterinary care. So can you tell us a little bit about that, about some of those services that are available for people? Sure, definitely. Every month we host an event uh, called the Better Neighbor Project Pet Wellness Day, and we have different providers that provide uh, vaccines, so small animals like puppies and kittens, um, just like humans, get vaccinated against certain illnesses, uh, so that way they don't attract those illnesses that could be potentially fatal. So those vaccines are a really simple way to keep your pet safe, but not so simple for people who might not be able to afford it. So our goal is to be able to get the word out to people who really need it. And a lot of times it's word of mouth, meaning like you guys hear about this event and then you hear somebody talking about, you know, that they need grooming. You can tell them, oh, I've heard of these events. Maybe you should look it up online and really just making sure that our whole community knows that these resources are available. So that way somebody is, a, you know, sitting at, like at home being like, oh, I'm, I'm such a bad pet mom. I can't get my dog groomed. You know, that is that shame and that um, those negative feelings. One, don't you, you know, they're not, they're not real. You are not a bad pet mom or dad. Um, but being able to keep the awareness that they can help their pet for free is something that we really strive to achieve. It's really important to have these conversations with kids for a couple of reasons. 
they are taking these messages home. They're taking these messages out to their community. And what we find is that there's not a lot of discussion around poverty, around homelessness, even homeless animals. These are often topics that are uncomfortable for people. They're also not necessarily written into curriculum. And so expecting that our educators are going to be able to fill those information gaps and engage our students in conversation on these topics, it's a lot to ask of schools and of teachers. So it's a really wonderful opportunity for us as the Giving Spirit to partner with a school that wants to bring these conversations into the classroom and then wants to see those conversations extend home. So it's so important that we share facts and information with these students. They're curious and they're hungry. We really learned that we gave them a chance to submit questions that we could ask of the panelists, and they were really thoughtful and oftentimes reflected the fact that the students didn't really understand what the state of homelessness in animals and people and the importance of the connection between those two, that human-animal bond. There's just information that they don't have but that they want. So a chance to share that information, to share stories with them, because that's really central to the Giving Spirit mission, is sharing perspectives, growing empathy, and then giving them thought-provoking ideas, things that they could go home with, to share both facts and possible action steps that any student can walk out the door and do. Number one thing, don't do anything on your own. You find an adult and figure out what's a good way forward to use your heart and your head and your hands. Well, thank you. That was a beautiful ending. Thank you so much, Stacey. Wow.